Hey, this is Tim back for Wrong Sports Episode 5, and I'm going to be talking about a doozy on this one. This is the 1951 point shaving scandal. This scandal was the ultimate betting gambling scandal of all time. It not only affected one school, but it directly affected seven NCAA schools and players on their men's basketball teams. The 1951 scandal is so famous that it destroyed New York College basketball powerhouses. Yes, two powerhouses. It affected Kentucky's chances at a national title and sent dozens of men to prison, with one being a prominent basketball player whose chances to go pro to the NBA went away with that prison sentence. So to tell the story of the scandal, we have to start at the beginning of basically college basketball. It was well known for years that teams, especially on the East Coast, they drew heavy interest from gamblers. Just after World War II, though, college basketball was getting bigger and bigger, especially on the East Coast, which would have double and triple headers at Madison Square Garden, which drew big crowds. Madison Square Garden and other promoters would then establish the National Invitational Tournament which was a tournament at the time for the best teams in the nation, and it was done before the NCAA established their tournament. So the NIT at that time was actually the way that they found the national champion. It was also well known that before games at Madison Square Garden and even during the NIT tournament, there were line makers and other gamblers lurking around, talking to players and coaches, trying to get an edge on the game and also to help make point spreads. This also led to more gamblers being a part of the game as the new scam, point shaving, started as gamblers sold to players that everyone wins because the players were going to play to win the game, but to stay under the point line that was set so that gamblers could win too. College basketball in the 1940s and 50s had a few powerhouses like Kentucky and Kansas, but none were bigger than New York powerhouses CCNY or the City College of New York and LIU or Long Island University. CCNY was coached by Nat Holman, who won over 75% of his games, and LIU was coached by Claire B., who would invent a lot of coaching schemes still used to this day. But these two teams were the talk of New York City and college basketball at the time, as both won national titles as well as winning the NIT tournament. But anyway, with all that background on college basketball, we got to get to the actual problem of college basketball, which at that time was gambling and point shaving. But all of these problems from this point on for the schools involved in the point shaving scheme all started with summer games played at fancy country clubs throughout the Catskills in New York. It was known for most of the 1900s that some of the best high school players would get jobs at these resorts or country clubs and play basketball on the teams there. There was also betting going on between the club members on these games, but nothing too big. There were also some who worked at the club, like chefs, that would also set lines on the games and take bets and then tell players on those teams to win the game, but under a certain number, and in return, get steak and lobster all week. So it was kind of a point-shaving scheme right there, but it didn't involve money. It was quick, though, that this evolved into something more nefarious and involved money. It was all perpetrated by a defensive-minded guard named Eddie Gard. Now, Eddie Gard knew that rich Italian mafiosos also summered in the Catskills, and they were looking to make some money as well so he went about finding one who wanted to help both of them make a little extra money guard met with salvatore salazzo he was a petty criminal who also was looking to make a quick buck or two they began to fix games together in the cat skills with guard convincing his fellow players that while steak and lobster was great they could make thousands of bucks if they simply followed his lead They did follow his lead, and the players and guard were paid nicely for their summer jobs. And I'm putting quotations around summer jobs. But after the summer, guard would go back to school at Long Island University, and he would bring the scheme back to the school for the 1950-51 season. The first game that guard said he intentionally fixed was on January 17, 1950, and it was against North Carolina State. Now, guard was able to recruit not only himself, but also two players on the team to help him out during that game. So LIU was able to win the game by only three points instead of a higher line, which, is, which was right around eight or nine points. Guard made a few thousand dollars, but was looking to make more money, so he needed to recruit more players. So he went to the best player on his team, and probably the best player in college basketball at the time, Sherman White. Sherman White at the time was the leading scorer in the entire NCAA, and he was averaging about 20 points a game. Guard would charm White into the scheme as well by telling White that they were not going to intentionally lose games, but they were going to make the games closer, but still win. Plus, to make sure that Sherman White was going to get on board, there was also a lavish dinner put on by Salazzo and a guarantee of $1,000 a game for Sherman White if he hopped on board with the scheme. So after all of that whining and dining, he eventually did get on board with guard as well. 
So the scheme was now in full swing during the season, but the only problem was that LIU, when trying to keep the games close, would accidentally lose two of the games that they tried to win. It was good for Salazzo and guard as everyone made their money, but Salazzo was looking to make a little bit more and also not get caught. So an associate of Salazzo approached Norm Major. He was a player on CCNY and was able to recruit him in the scheme and had him also recruit others on CCNY. So the scheme would now spread throughout college basketball for the next two years. And this is where I'm going to be jumping around a little bit to tell you more about the other schools involved in this scheme because it was more than just CCNY and LIU, though they were the big parts of this, there were other smaller schools that got involved as well. One of those other schools was not small. It was actually Kentucky, as they were a small part of the scandal, but they were still a part of it during one of their most successful periods. Kentucky at this time had the fabulous five of Ralph Beard, Alex Groza, Wallace Jones, Cliff Barker, and Kenny Rollins. The Fab Five not only won a few national championships at Kentucky, but they were also the heart of the USA basketball team that won the gold medal at the 1948 Olympics. Beard, Groza, and another player, not part of the Fab Five, but he was part of the Kentucky team and the Olympic team, was Dale Barnstable. They would all be implicated in the scandal eventually. This was significant, though, as Beard and Groza were playing in the NBA at the time that they were caught, and Barnstable was about to start his after-college life as a high school coach. According to the case, though, Beard and Groza and Barnstable took $500 to $700 to point shave a game, just one game, in the 1949 NIT tournament. Also, the scheme would go to the Midwest as it hit Bradley University pretty much the worst in the Midwest. They were a powerhouse in the 1940s and 50s, going to the NIT national title game in 1950, which coincidentally was against CCNY. Bradley players Bill Mann, Bud Grover, Aaron Preecy, Jim Kelly, and Gene Melichor also admitted to taking bribes from gamblers to hold down scores against St. Joseph's in Philadelphia in 1951 and also against Oregon State in Chicago that same season. So now the scandal was in New York, Kentucky, in Illinois, and it would also go to other schools in the South and the Midwest, though on a much smaller scale, probably about one player on the team or so in those other schools. Though the scandal would go on strong throughout 1951, it was eventually found out in probably the craziest way possible. The player that signaled the authorities to the scheme was Janice Kellogg. He was a standout, a six foot eight standout on Manhattan College. He was also their center as well. He was also one of the first African-American starters on the Manhattan team. He was offered a bribe of $1,000 to shave points before a game against DePaul. Although he was working for a minimum wage job at the time and probably could have used the money, he refused and instead reported the offer to his coach, Ken Norton. Norton sent him to the district attorney of New York. After that, the New York City District Attorney's Office knew something might be happening as there were other whispers all throughout the year about CCNY and LIU and other schools point shaving. So the office sent Kellogg to go back to the solicitors, but this time he wore a wire and was able to take the bribe and get the gamblers on tape about this scheme. Kellogg did just that, and the district attorney had all he needed to close the case on this scandal. So once the New York City District Attorney's Office and the DA Frank Hogan had what he needed to start the arrests, he did this, that. And the first arrest started on February 18th, 1951, and the arrest of seven men on charges of conspiring to fix games. Those taken into custody included All-American forward Ed Werner, center Ed Roman, and guard Al Roth. The three starters were all a part of CCNY's five that won both the NIT and NCAA tournaments the previous year. They would also start arresting players on Long Island University and started with standout Sherman White, as well as Kentucky players Beard, Groza, and Barnstable, and three Bradley players. The arrests made big news all around the country as the police and DA's office arrested these CCNY players in Penn Station when the team returned to New York from a Philadelphia game. It was also big news because in total, 32 players from seven colleges admitted to taking bribes between 1947 and 1950 and to fix 86 games in 17 states across that time as well. So once the arrests started happening and the scheme was busted wide open, it didn't take long for this scandal to start affecting schools, especially those in New York City. The City College of New York was probably hit the hardest as they were found to not only have this gambling scandal, but they were also found to have other penalties. So because of that, the school de-emphasized their entire athletic program as they dropped down from Division I to now what is called Division III. Also, their coach, Nat Holman, who was cleared in the point-shaving scheme, was suspended after the 1951-52 season. 
but he would eventually return for brief stints from 1954 to 56 and from 58 to 59, but he was never able to get to the heights he once did in the late 40s and 50s, and he eventually retired in 1959. Nat Holman was eventually inducted into the National Hall of Fame in 1964, but this wasn't the only problem that CCNY had to account for. They also had to account for eight players being charged in this scheme, the most players of any team involved in this gambling scheme. Six out of the eight were given suspended sentences, while Ed Warner was sentenced to six months in jail and Al Roth was sentenced to six months in a workhouse, but eventually his sentence was suspended. Meanwhile, Long Island University shut down its entire athletic program from 1951 to 1957 and did not return to Division I until the 1980s. Also, LIU player Sherman White, who led college in points per game in 1951, was jailed for almost a year at Rikers Island. He was the only player in the scheme who would eventually be jailed and would also be banned from the NBA for life. The crazy thing about Sherman White, though, he would go down in the history books as one of the greatest college basketball players to never play in the NBA because of this gambling scheme. But now turning to Kentucky, they were forced to cancel one season of play, the 1952-53 season, and would not be able to go to the NCAA tournament in 1953-54, even though they were 25-0 at the end of the season because a few of their players graduated already due to the players being at school during the time of the team's suspension and lost their eligibility. Also, former Kentucky players Groza, Beard, and Barnstable were placed on indefinite probation and barred all of them from sports for three years. The NBA commissioner also suspended the trio for life, even though Beard and Groza were in the NBA at the time. Bradley wasn't hurt too much as three of their players, a part of the scheme, pleaded guilty to misdemeanors but avoided jail time, while the other players weren't charged at all. Bradley would then go to another Final Four in 1954 and continue to play in Division I till this day. Finally, let's get to the men who started this whole gambling situation. First, Salvatore Salazzo. He served 12 years in prison and was also handed a $1.1 million bill from the federal government for his evasion of taxes. Now, while Salazzo was being handed that prison sentence and Sherman White was being handed that prison sentence, the LIU player and introducer of the scheme to the players, Eddie Gard, was given an indeterminate sentence of up to three years. He would only serve nine months in prison and was praised by the the assistant DA for his cooperation during the scandal. So actually, Guard was given a slap on the wrist compared to Sherman White. But this scandal is by far the largest and craziest of all the gambling schemes, and I'm sure I missed a few pieces here and there, but I really wanted to cover it as it ruined New York City college basketball for about 20 years, as those New York City schools would take a while to get back to glory, and Madison Square Garden would also stop allowing games to be played there for quite a while. And it also took about 20 to 25 years before the National Invitational Tournament returned to MSG as well. But here's the craziest thing about this scandal, is that all while this was going on, CCNY would win about 90% of their games, and they actually won the National Championship in 1950, winning the NCAA Tournament and the NIT Tournament. And in those years after, there was evidence that they shaved a few games during the 1950 season, too. So that proves how good CCNY was at the time that they shaved points off of their games and they still won most of them. So anyway, thank you so much for hanging out with me with Wrong Sports Episode 5. As always, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And if you have any other ideas of any college scandals or schemes I should be covering, comment them at the bottom. But I think for Episode 6, I'm not going to go in a gambling direction. I'm going to go in a more uh, crazier direction. you got to stay tuned for that one. But thank you so much for hanging out with me. Again, like, share, and subscribe, and I'll check back with you in a couple of weeks.